Welcome to Calvary Lutheran Church's Organ Bench Devotion. I'm very excited to be with you today. I've done a ton of research on this hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, and the fifth gospel, Isaiah, and the meaning behind these words, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. I hope you'll stay with me and enjoy some good organ music and also learn a little bit more about the scriptures. We're going to look at this hymn from LSB 451, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, See Him Dying on the Tree. Now, where do those words come from? They come from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, part of what's called the Suffering Servant Psalm. Now, Kelly, Thomas Kelly, he's from Ireland, an Anglican priest who wrote over 750 hymns. He's the son of Thomas Kelly, and that's going to be really important. He's a judge of the Irish Court of Common Praise, Thomas Jr. He studied law, and that's going to go a lot into this hymn, as you're going to see in a few minutes. Stricken and Smitten was published as part of hymns based on various scriptures in Dublin, 1804. So it comes from Isaiah 53, 4, where it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet he considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Now, the hymn isn't based on the New International Version, which is from 1984, rewritten in 2011, but it's based on the King James Version, which Thomas Kelly would have been using at the time where it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Hence our title of the hymn. Now, what is this whole psalm from the Old Testament in Isaiah? It's been called a suffering servant psalm. Now, who is this servant? Now, if you ask your average Jewish rabbi, they will say, no, this is Israel. Israel summed up as one person. He is suffering and representative of all the people. And you look at all that the Jews have gone through from being in Egypt, from being put into Babylon. And nowadays, until the early 1900s, Israel was exiled from their country again. But if you look at the scriptures as a whole, though, I don't think this is the only explanation because really the servant king earlier in Isaiah is representative. He goes through this trouble, this messianic king. Now, yeah, Israel suffers, you and I suffer, but Jesus, he as the king suffers as one person for all of Israel, for all people of the earth. Now, as we read it, I want you to see how you can see it as we deserve to suffer and Israel deserves to suffer, but Jesus suffers in our place. So let's look at the meaning of the original Hebrew. It starts out, we're just going to look at this one verse right now. Surely he took up our pain. So this one servant. Literally, it means, but our sicknesses or incurable diseases he carried. So this servant took what none of us can endure, and the pains he bore them. This is sometimes called the substitutionary atonement. So to make God be willing to look at us, Jesus took our place. He was our substitute to bring us back together with God. Now, let's look at those three words, stricken, smitten, afflicted. The first word is stricken or in Hebrew, naga. Uh, literally, in the NIV it says, but we considered him punished by God, or in the King James Version, but we considered him stricken. Well, the actual meaning of the Hebrew word was to be struck, or plagued, mark, heavy marks put on one. Brown's Driver and Driggs is just a Hebrew dictionary that's very well respected. Well, example, if you were in those plagues where the Egyptians were plagued 10 different times by God, they were struck. The same word is used. They were struck with frogs. They were struck with 
blood. They were struck with gar- darkness. And finally, the final plague was the firstborn son of every human and animal was struck. They were killed. You see, a plague is to be struck. Do you want to be struck by God? Well, now you know what to be stricken is all about. Or God punished the Egyptians when, if you recall, Abraham pretended his wife Sarah was his sister. Well, she kind of was his half-sister, but but they were going to sleep with her, and God struck them with plagues. Or Proverbs 6.32 says, But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself, or blows, strikes, and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. So stricken in the mind, stricken maybe in the body, feeling this guilt from then on, or maybe even stricken with some sexually transmitted disease. You get the idea. Uh, It goes on, not just stricken, but smitten. The original word is huka or nakaz, the root. Stricken by him or stricken by God. It, It literally means to receive a blow, be wounded, be beaten, be fatally smitten, be killed or slain, be attacked, captured or smitten by disease or be blighted. This is physical harm. Some examples in the Old Testament, Isaiah 1, verse 5, graphically describes Judah getting beaten up. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. You picture a guy being beaten down on the ground. That's what it means to be smitten. Or Exodus chapter 5, you remember when Moses came in and he told Pharaoh, let my people go free, and then Pharaoh basically said, well, make them work harder, and he did. And then the people started complaining. Look at the the words. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers. That is, they smote them. They, uh, They were smitten. And they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday and today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten or smitten. But the fault is on your own people. Or the last word, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. And this is an unusual word. I I thought this was interesting. Ana, literally. Afflicted, to be bowed down or afflicted. It comes in a fancy Hebrew word, the pu'al, to be afflicted in discipline by God, to be humbled by fasting. And what I thought's interesting is most of this happens in one's mind. We're brought down. For example, in Leviticus 23 29, it says, Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement. And that happened in the fall every year. And they were supposed to take the week off. And they're supposed to clean the temple and clean all the sin by these special sacrifices. And it says, when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God, those who do not deny or afflict, discipline themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. It takes some effort to take the week off. It's an affliction of mind and body. It could be with fasting or other things. Or Psalm 119.71, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees or learn your scriptures. So affliction, to, to take the trouble to learn the Bible, it's good to go through that trouble so that you take it seriously. So in the hymn, that's what Kelly is doing. Thomas Kelly here is applying this stricken, smitten, and afflicted as it applies to Jesus. Look at the scripture. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. You see, this is that stricken and smitten, literal hitting and pounding. We don't know for sure what kind of whips they use, but it's been suggested it was these bones attached to the whip. 
And you've probably seen it in the Passion of the Christ. The crown of thorns, we know what that is, and that's no good. It caused a literal beating of his head. He slapped on the face. But he's also afflicted as he has that robe put on him. He's tormented in who he really is. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis Christ by man rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet David's son, yet David's Lord. Proofs I see sufficient of it. Tis the true and faithful word. Or verse 2, tell me, ye who hear him groaning, was there ever grief like this? See, he's taking the punishment of the whole world on himself. There's no other punishment like that. Friends, the fear and cause disowning foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him. In fact, the scripture says that you and I raised our hands to kill him with our sins. We put him to death too. None would intervene to save but the deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. Who killed Jesus? Was it you and me? Was it Pilate? Was it the soldiers? The reality is, it is the Father who killed Jesus for justice. Look, look at Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? He didn't spare his son. He had to die. He took on the sin of the world. And so God the Father had to take his life through the means of those Roman soldiers and Pilate and Judas betraying him. And, or Isaiah itself, our reading, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. You see, God took his very life for us. Do you see your sins there? You're no longer going to be killed because God saved you. Let's take a few moments now as you listen to this organ improvisation. Read the scripture along with it and hear that melody and Thomas Kelly's words as he puts him, the scripture into music.